You know, in 2006, um, Greg Mortison published a book, Three Cups of Tea, that went on to sell five million copies and generate $50 million of donations to the Central Asia Institute, an NGO run by the author. And the mission of the Institute was to build schools in Afghanistan. And its core conviction was that terrorism could be defeated if only we could educate children, particularly girls, and sort of get them out of the clutches of Islamic fundamentalists. Now, the American military loved this so much that every single soldier dispatched to Afghanistan got a free copy of the book. The book kind of reaffirmed America's faith in the inherent simplicity of the world. And then things began to unravel. It turned out that the book was more fiction than fact, including his account of being kidnapped by the Taliban. It turned out that the Institute and the author were spending millions of dollars to purchase media coverage in order to promote the book. Indeed, they were buying tens of thousands of copies of the book on Amazon to keep it at number one. And as the author was flying around doing lectures on a private jet, very few schools were actually getting built in Afghanistan. Indeed, the treasurer of that institute famously remarked that Mortison was using the institution as his personal ATM. Now, a very sad story, but the real question that it begs is why do we have this faith in Western education to be the panacea, to lift people out of poverty, to address social justice, and in the case of the Mortison scandal, to solve the problems of Afghanistan? You know, it's one element of the development paradigm that is never challenged, but my experience has always been that education, particularly in the developing world, is more about enculturation than it is about the transmission of information and knowledge, let alone the fomenting of creativity. And this certainly was the role of education on the coast of British Columbia during the colonial era. You know, Justice St. Clair famously says that there are only three things in life to know about. Who am I? Where do I come from? And where am I going? And he said that when the missionaries arrived, they essentially said to the First Nations of the coast that all of your answers for all of those questions for all of your history, have been wrong. Now, how would we feel, for example, if some authority that we could not challenge came into our lives, took away our children at the way of, of three and four and five years old, knowing full well that they were in the process of indoctrinating them to have complete contempt for everything that we and our grandfathers had stood for? Well, that's exactly what happened in the residential schools. But there are two important things to remember about it. These institutions were created with the best of intentions by people whose concern for the well-being of indigenous people in the wake of the conquest was matched in its intensity only by their ignorance of Native American life. Secondly, we forget that these residential schools were still functioning as late as the 1970s. And even more importantly, the essential pedagogy continues to be the pedagogy of this Western curriculum that is imposed on peoples throughout the world. Now, the idea, of course, and the difference, I suppose, is that in place of a, a process of conversion to Christianity, now the conversion is to the cult of modernity. Now, what is this thing, modernity? Because we created modernity, we tend to think of it as existing outside of culture and history, when, of course, it's a product of both. Modernity, as we know it, is not 300 years old, and that shallow history shouldn't suggest to any of us that we have all of the answers for all of the challenges that will confront us as a species in the coming millennium. And then modernity then, if you think of this process of transition from tradition to the global economy or modernity, whatever you want to call it, as being a kind of chemical equation, well, the catalyst is education, and this is how it works. In the pastoral nomadic traditions of East Africa, particularly in the Kaisu Desert of northern Kenya, drought is not some kind of cruel anomaly, but rather a regular feature of climate, and surviving drought is a key imperative that allows a people to be. And as pastoral nomads, of course, it behooves the people to have vast numbers of herds of cattle and camels so that if you do have a devastating drought, at least some of your biological capital, your economic wealth, will survive. And that becomes something that sort of moves through the entire society. In order to have lots of cattle, 
it's helpful to have lots of children. So it shouldn't surprise us to learn that these societies are polygynous. And it's not unusual for an elder to have three, four, even five wives. But that creates a problem. What do you do with young men of marriageable age who don't have access to wives? Well, you basically get rid of them if you control the power of the politics and the magic. And you exile them to remote encampments. But to make their separation from the community desire, desirable, you envelop it in prestige. In the most important moment in a young man's life, a, a moment he has trained for for at least a, a decade, is his public circumcision, where he sits still, his back supported by the knees of his best friend as cow's milk is poured over his body, and he waits for the ritual circumciser who will slit his foreskin seven times, transforming him from child into warrior. Now, should he flinch or, or show any sign of pain, he will shame his clan and his people forever. But few flinch, for the honor is so great. And so transformed into a maron, a warrior, he lives a life of Riley, living in remote fora encampments, raiding the enemy for cattle, protecting your own herds, serviced by these young squires who come out, dazzled by the power of the warrior, living on a diet of herbs gathered in the shade of frail acacia trees, mixed with milk, and of course blood drawn with a ritual arrow from the jugular of a heifer, a kind of salty strawberry smoothie. But you still have this problem of the human libido. What do you do with all these young warriors who don't have access to women of marriageable age? Well, you solve that problem by allowing them to come back to the community as long as they don't engage with the women who are married. And they're encouraged to openly bead or have lovers amongst the young maidens. And, and those relationships can continue up until the moment the woman is engaged to an elder, and then the relationship must stop. But the warrior is expected to come to the girl's marriage ceremony and openly mock the virility of the old goat who has taken her away. But the marvelous idea is that a single adaptive imperative surviving drought bifurcates throughout the entire culture and, in a sense, makes it what it is. Now, here's where we get back to education. One key way of surviving drought is to have one foot in the cash economy. So there's a great incentive to educate an elder son, which is fine. But the problem is that these boys go off to schools controlled by the state, or in some cases by missionaries, where they acquire a modicum of literacy, but in a context, critically, that teaches them to have contempt for who they are as pastoral nomads, because pastoral nomads don't fit Kenya's image of itself as a modern state. So as a result, they go into school as a nomad, graduate as a clerk, can't go back, and going forward simply means to join an economy with a 40% unemployment rate for high school graduates. So they drift to the slums of Nairobi, and they try to scratch a living from the edges of a cash economy. Now, that looks to the development paradigm all for the good. Per capita income has gone up, urbanization has gone up, literacy has gone up, but in fact, quality of life has gone down. And how often do we hear third world leaders saying, we've got to prepare our people for the global economy? What does it mean to a Warani warrior in the forests of Ecuador, a people first contacted in 1958, known to the outsiders as Auka, a pejorative term in Quechua meaning savage? And of course, they thought all outsiders were Kuwadi. But the Warani welcomed contact because it broke a cycle of blood feuds that had resulted in 54% of their mortality being due to them spearing each other. And they welcomed education because it offered access to outside goods. But these were true natural philosophers of the rainforest. They knew that forest so well, their hunters could smell animal urine at 40 paces and tell you what form of life had left it behind. But what did education mean? The arrival of Ecuadorian or Quechua teachers who had utter contempt for the Warani culture, the language, the way of life. They were enculturated only to become consumers in the national economy of Ecuador. And as a result, high school graduates of the Warani know less about the forest upon which their people depended than young children of five who have yet to have their spirits crushed in these schools. I made a film with Carol Black called Schooling the World, and our crew dropped into a classroom in Ladakh. Now, all through India, Ladakh, Nepal, 
the vestiges of the old British educational system is there. And remember what the minutes of education that Macaulay wrote said, our goal is to make people brown on the outside and white on the inside. This is education by rote, it's militaristic kind of pedagogy, and of course, in the end, it's the generation of a sense of humiliation, and here's how that happens. We walked into the schoolroom, and a biology teacher was teaching a course in botany. In a curriculum she didn't understand, in a language she could hardly speak to children who could not understand that language either, English. But these students are not allowed to speak their native languages, just like the people up and down the coast here were forbidden to speak their native tongue. So she's saying to the people, xerophytic plants. Now, a xerophytic plant is simply a plant that grows in a, uh, a dry habitat. But she didn't quite understand the concept, so she's saying, xerophytic plant, bad plant, grows bad places, Ladakh, xerophytic plants, lots of plants, Ladakh, bad places. And so the message these students are getting is that Ladakh is somehow an inferior place where you look out the window of the school and you see this stunningly beautiful flora and you know that the grandparents of every one of those kids knows that flora with the perspicacity of a Harvard-trained botanist. And yet they are seen and, 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 and taught to be ashamed of who they are. And another part of this, of course, is two classic myths. We promote Western education around the world as if it's landing in a void as if peoples throughout the world did not educate their children. Well, of course they did, in complex, sophisticated ways, whether it was a 2,500 years of empirical observation as to the nature of mind in Tibetan Buddhism, the nocturnal studies of the elder brother who literally believed that their prayers maintained the cosmic balance of the world, you know, textile traditions in Peru, uh, throughout the South Pacific, you know, so, the other great myth is that somehow education lifts people out of poverty. On the contrary, the process of globalization cements people into poverty. I have never in my life in traditional cultures seen the wretchedness that one encounters around the periphery of almost any city in the so-called third world. And in the end then we have to ask ourselves even what is this thing of Western education? How great is it? If we look at our own culture, for example, and the United States, for example, the average American youth by the age of 18 has spent four years watching television and playing video games, contributing to the obesity epidemic so severe that it's been seen to be a, a national security issue by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In the cities as diverse as Dallas, Atlanta, New Orleans, Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, Detroit, New York, less than 50% of high school students managed to graduate. 16 million American high school students suffer from clinical depression. 1.6 million are on more than one, two antipsychotic drugs. 120,000 have tried to commit suicide in the last 12 months. So what exactly are the benefits of this worldview that allow us to have such confidence that it is the way of life for all peoples of the world. And this is where we get back to terrorism. You know, culture is not trivial. The one lesson of anthropology is that culture is not the songs we sing, the prayers we utter, the clothes we wear, even the cosmologies we celebrate. Ultimately, culture is about a body of moral and ethical values that every culture places around each individual to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies within each of us. It's culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, to find order and meaning in the universe, to do what Lincoln said, always seek the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, when people, through volition or coercion, turn their backs on the constraints of tradition, often because they aspire to a world of affluence in which they will never find a place. The only place that will be theirs will be the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere. Disaffected, alienated, taught to be a failure, unemployable, with no access to employment, they settle around the periphery of the cities of the world. And that is where terrorism comes from. Terrorism comes out of hopelessness. 
and hopelessness can come about when we do not fulfill the promises of education, even as we tear people from the constraints of their traditions. And it doesn't have to be like this. The issue isn't to say that education is wrong. Of course, it's a wonderful thing. But it all depends on the context and the manner in which the pedagogy is promoted. If, for example, the issue isn't the traditional versus the modern, it's the rights of free people to choose the components of their lives. No one is talking about keeping people frozen in time any more than we're suggesting that any of us go back to a pre-industrial past. The issue is how do we find a way for all peoples to benefit from the best of international education, if you will, without critically that engagement demanding the death of their ethnicity. Because again, when you lose those constraints, anything can happen. Now, if we go to a success story, in the Northwest Amazon of Colombia, the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, the Macuna, the Tanimuco. When I first worked there in the 1970s, it was a sad place. You felt that something important had happened but a very long time ago. The missionaries seemed to be everywhere. And then an amazing thing happened. The president of Columbia said to a friend of mine, Martin von Hildebrand, do something for the Indians. And in five extraordinary years, Martin did more than something. He secured legal land rights for an area of land collectively the size of the United Kingdom for the 57 ethnicities of the Northwest Amazon. And behind a veil of isolation created by the absence of the nation state in that part of the lowland forest, a forest incidentally the size of France, a whole new dream of culture was born. I went back there to make a film for the National Geographic a couple of years ago with Stephen Hugh Jones, who was head of anthropology at Cambridge. And Stephen had been part of a film series called Disappearing Worlds in the early 70s, in which he predicted the demise of all these peoples, a tragedy unfolding, as he put it. He walked into a longhouse the size of this room, 250 barasana in full ritual regalia, men, women, children, three days and nights of taking yahe ayahuasca in celebration of cassava woman. And he got on the satellite phone to his wife and he said, Christine, it's incredible. The only thing that disappeared are the fucking missionaries. <laughs> and, we asked, and we asked an elder, why did you let these missionaries do this to you? And he said something very powerful. They promised us they could make us human. And that's the process of colonization, is to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. And we cannot do that with education. And if you look around the world, you'll see that every one of these cultures has something to say. Every one should be heard. Each are part of our overall human repertoire. We need the prayers of these young monks, just like we need the hopes of this young warrior on the Serengeti Plain, because these diverse voices of humanity, their intuitions about the nature of being alive, their own educational systems are all part of our collective geography of hope. Thanks very much.